marriage ban, the same-sex marriage ban came down in 2004. It was August the 13th, which was a Friday. John Howard, under the Liberal Party, enacted the marriage equality uh, ban through the, um, amending the Marriage Act um, and made marriage between a man and a woman exclusive of all others. LGBTI, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, intersex or queer couples or queer individuals went to a heterosexual wedding. They would hear that legislation being read out and they would be reminded of their second class citizenship status. Emotionally, it was quite devastating to the queer community at the time when it happened. Um, there was at least one person who attempted suicide. It was in the lead up to an election and my feeling is it was the same tactic that, that, that they'd tried earlier with refugees to great effect. It's a rule, a tactic um, used by the rich to divide working people and the poor. When we're up and fighting and rearing against the corporate elite in whatever form it takes, um, it's really good for the bosses to be able to divide and say, you shouldn't take any notice of that union official. They're gay, um, they're queer. Stick the boot into a minority, scapegoat them for the ills of society um, in the hope of winning the election. They tried that with us. The thing is though, they didn't get the same reaction as what they did from with the refugees. It's a really important thing to break down that um, division within the working class because it means that people realise that actually it's not the queers that they're fighting against and they're not abnormal, it's the, um, the corporate elite. The ban came through, we had a very angry rally um, that marched to the Labor Party headquarters because of course the ALP voted alongside the Liberal Party for this ban um, and then from then on Community Action Against Homophobia initiated a national response to the ban but it was in Sydney that the marriage campaign really kicked off and um, so we also then occupied the birth, deaths and marriages um, in New South Wales, which was really good and, and a, a lesbian couple married there. Small but very, very important because it was the beginning of what, what would become the biggest movement in queer Australian history. It was at a time of my life when I was first discovering the queer community and meeting people who were homeless, who were suicidal, had drug abuse issues, and um, a lot of this was related to homophobia. They'd been kicked out of their home, um, their, their home by their homophobic parents. Just this horrific human situation. I just, I, I didn't know how to live on this planet um, side by side with this situation. And so I decided that um, if I do nothing else in my life, I'll, I'll take this on, I'll change this. Um, and so yeah, I, and then the marriage ban happened and that um, provided the political opening to, to take it on. From the beginning stages of the campaign, SBS did a poll. They were the only ones to have done a poll at um, 2004 and only 33% of the population supported marriage equality. From 2005, 2006, we started Community Action Against Homophobia really moved to organise national days of action against uh, the marriage ban on the day itself, August the 13th. And all the rights that flow from having our relationships equal before the law and society. We started to see a real shift in um, in consciousness, in public opinion, um, in our favour, which was fantastic. Now the latest poll shows 72% and um, if you think what that entails about what people think about homosexuality itself, that's a pretty enormous social shift away from homophobia. Getting rid of bigotry has a real impact on young people um, and developing their confidence. There was one high school where a boy came out to his school in assembly and he got a standing ovation. And um, that would have been unthinkable when I went to high school. I was in high school in the mid 90s. Like f f to do that, y you would have been beaten up, no question, in my high school. I mean, we've won 75 to 80, 85 percent of the youth support the marriage equality campaign, and the campaign really hit the high schools. That's been the base of the campaign. All these rallies have been attended by really young um, people who are you know, um, taking up bigotry and homophobia in their own schools and also really um, supporting their high school mates as they come out of the closet. 
as they transition from male to female or female to male, as they transition into um, a sex and gender diverse um, or non-specific sex. All of this stuff was really inspiring to see. It's all elbows in here, isn't it? An inhumane position against condom use. Shame! 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 Condom saved lives! Shame! 600 to 1,000 South Africans that die every day from HIV AIDS! Shame! was coming in a um, massive pilgrimage, World Youth Day, with um, possibly up to 100,000, 200,000 people from Catholics from all over the world. We organised a rally and we said the Pope is wrong, put a condom on in reference to his homophobic and anti-condom stance. We also took him up on abortion rights. So we had this massive rally, 1,000, 1,500 people. The government tried to pass a law against us rallying called the Annoyance Law, which was um, fines of $5,000 for annoying a pilgrim, um, and we took that to court and we won. The note of Pope one was funny, like people, yeah, I, I think um, the Sydney, city of Sydney start, tried to bring in some, uh, some ridiculous regulations about um, wearing offensive t-shirts <laughs> when the Pope was in town. And so people made some really, really funny offensive t-shirts in response to that, which, you know, some of them were really, really rude. I like the really, really rude ones, but I'm not gonna say those on camera, but they were hilarious. <laughs> then in England, they did the same thing a few years later. So um, rallied against the, the Pope and the, the bigotry and of the Catholic hierarchy. So that was really good. There was a real um, argument running through the LGBTI community. Um, we don't want to get married. It's a heterosexual, um, patriarchal, conservative unit and we don't want it. We, we, we never decided to campaign for the right to marry because we wanted a white picket fence. Our look was we are under attack from the federal government. We have to stand up for ourselves. Getting rid of the institution of marriage itself, it, frankly, that requires revolution and frankly, um, you don't get to the point of revolution if you don't defend a minority group when it's under attack from the federal government. If you don't defend a minority group in those circumstances, there's no, no way that minority group will join you in making a revolution. When I was angry um, and before the marriage ban happened in 2003, I, I used to like watching footage of the March on Washington that the Black Civil Rights Movement did led by Martin Luther King. And I, I just thought to myself, we're, we're going to do that one day. <laughs> and I suppose the idea was always in the back of my mind. And then um, when the protests started getting really, really big in 2009, that was when the protests started getting really, really big. Like the, the Melbourne rally was 4,000 people and there'd never been a, a protest for queer rights that big in this country before. But then I started thinking, now's the time to call for a national convergence. If we can get that, those numbers in the major cities, if everybody comes together, we can get 10,000 people. Massive, massive 10,000 strong rally at the Labor Party National Conference, which was in Sydney. That was the, the, the biggest queer rights protest that's ever been held in this country and it was magic, it was electric, best day of my life, amazing. And the Labor Party then changed its formal party platform to support marriage equality but then gave its MPs a conscience vote. So that meant that basically the bigots and the homophobes in Parliament could go, oh well I've got a conscience and that conscience involves bigotry so I'm not going to vote for the marriage equality bill. By the power invested in me by the Holy Dingo Mother, I pronounce you married. You may all kiss. <laughs> movement has um, emerged in a big way in this country as well. They had their first national convergence on Canberra, I believe in May 2011. They went to the federal government with a list of demands and they won some of them, um, which is very, very significant. Nori, who is sex and gender diverse or um, uh, sex non-specific, um, has won an X on Z's passport, which is fabulous. and. 
She's been a real advocate of the campaign and I think that um, you know, challenging those rigid gender binaries has have been a really strong component of the campaign. It's, it's equally a trans and intersex concern as it is a gay, lesbian, bisexual concern. So we have actually won marriage equality in Australia for six whole days and it was fabulous. That was last year, 2013. That was uh, an ACT bill, uh, state or territory bill, um, which was quashed by the High Court overturning it with the pushing of the Abbott Liberal Conservative government. We also won a whole bunch of things like registration schemes, so same-sex couples can register their relationship which assists them in court if there's some kerfuffles around homophobic families trying to um, get them out of the picture uh, and we've won surrogacy rights in Queensland. Federal anti-discrimination legislation. The de facto rights for same-sex couples the Labor Party really trumpeted that in 2008 as um, look how wonderful the federal Labor government is. We, we really, really care about queers, look full de facto rights. We've repealed 108 laws discriminating against queers. And you know, in other circumstances, you'd think the community would go, yay, at least we won something. But actually the community was very, very angry that we um, <laughs> that, that the government hadn't given us the right to marry and that shows the fire and the persistence in that campaign. <laughs> the, the biggest thing I think it's one is is the shift in public opinion. That's the that's the thing I think that makes the most difference to the most queer people's lives. If we don't mobilise people and if people are not prepared to um, get onto the streets in independent political action, um, then we're not, we aren't going to win. Um, I mean, we will have a little bit of victory here and there, but unless we mobilise um, and defend the, what we've got, the registration schemes, the civil unions, the X on the passport, all of those things, unless we defend that and extend it, then the ruling class is always going to take those um, concessions away. And I mean, in the end, I think like um, queer oppression is linked to women's oppression. Um, and I think that in the end, capitalism will not deliver queer liberation, just like it won't deliver women's uh, liberation, unless we actually decisively have a victory against the ruling class and the working class and the poor and the oppressed minorities take power, um, take control of production, then um, we're always going to be fight, fighting a defensive battle. And we want to fight an offensive battle and we want to win. Yeah, in the early days we didn't know that it would be big, we just thought, um, you know, where's this going, should we even continue? And, but somehow, I think in our subconscious, we knew that, that it would be big. <laughs> but, but the thing is, we weren't always conscious of that, and that was sometimes a bit troubling. But we kept at it, <laughs> and, um, and then it just mushroomed in 2009. And um, yeah, and that was really, really phenomenal. What do we want? <laughs>